اشار فرمایا حضر والا نے نفس کی دوسری قسم کے بارے میں نفس الوامہ اگر اس نفس امارہ کی اصلاح ناممکن ہوتی تو اللہ تعالیٰ نفس کے پانچ نام نازل نہ فرماتا جو شخص اصلاح کی نیت سے اللہ والوں کی صحبت اختیار کرتا ہے تو اس کا نفس نفس امارہ ترقی کر کے نفس الوامہ ہو جاتا ہے یعنی گناہ کر کے اس کو شرمی نگی اور ندامت ہونے لگتی ہے اپنے آپ کو منامت کرتا ہے کہ آہ میں کتنا کمیلہ انسان ہوں کہ خدا کا رزق کھا کر رہا رہا ہم رزق اور آتا ہوں جس کو اللہ اپنے ولی بناتا ہے اس کو گناہوں پر شرمی نگی دیتا ہے یہ ندامت علامت ویلایت ہے سن لے اے دوست جب ایام بلے آتے ہیں گاٹ ملے کی وہ خود آپ ہی بدلاتے ہیں نفس کی ترقی کا یہ ابتدائی درجہ ہے کہ نفس امارہ نفس لوامہ ہو جاتا ہے اور اس کو اپنی خطا پر ندامت اور اپنے اوپر ملامت کی توفیق ہونے لگتی ہے اور نار فغا عشقواری آہوزاری اور استغفار و توبہ سے اپنی خطاوں کی تلافی کرتا ہے پس نفس امارہ کا نفس لوامہ میں تبلیل ہو جانا اللہ تعالیٰ کی ویلائد اور محبوبیت کی طرف پہلا قدم ہے جس کی دلیل یہ آیت ہے وَلَا اُخْسِمُ مِن نَفْسِ اللَّوَامَ اور قسم ہے نفس اللَّوَامَ کی کیونکہ اللہ تعالیٰ شکور ہے کہ تھوڑے عمل پر کثیر رضا عطا فرماتے ہیں اس سے رجوع اور انعابت کے اس ادنا درجہ کی بھی اتنی قدر فرمائی کہ قرآن پاک میں اس کی قسم اتھائی جو اوپر مذکور ہے اور حدیث قرصی میں اشار فرمایا لَانِينُ الْمُذْنِبِينَ حَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِن زَجِلِ الْمُسَبِّحِين مجھے تصویح پرنے والوں کی بلند آوازوں سے زیادہ محبوب ہے اس پر میرے دو شعر ہے کیا ہے رابطہ آہ فغا کا کیا ہے رابطہ آہ فغا ہے فغا سے زمین کو کام ہے کچھ آسمان سے ندامت تجھ پر ہو رحمت خدا کی لیلا دی مغفرت رب جہا سے اے جلیل عشق گنہگار کے ایک قطرے کو اے فضیرت تیری تصویح کے سو دانوں پر اللہ لیسی ملفوظ پر گزیشہ کچھ ملیسوں میں کچھ بات چیت ہو رہی تھی کہ جس میں حضرت عرکاتہم نفس کی مختلف قسموں کا ذکر فرماتے ہیں سب سے پہلا وہ نفس امارہ تھا پھر اس کے بعد یہ نفس امارہ پر محنت کر کے یہ نفس لوامہ بن جاتا ہے تو جو لائے انسان اردو ساری اردو ہے سمپل اردو ہے سمجھ لیں گے اس لئے دیفکل الفاظ ہو تو انگلیش میں بتا دیں گے کبھی کبھی انگلیش میں بھی ہو جائے کرے گا انہاں فائلیس کو تو انگلیش میں ہوتا ہی ہے مستقیل اس طرح بیلنس بھی سورا مشکل سا ہوتا ہے کون سے زبان میں کیا جائے اور جو مزا اردو میں ہے وہ انگریزی میں نہیں ہے اب تک تو بیان تو پہلے تو انگریزی میں ہی ہوتا تھا جو اصل حلاوت ہے مزا ہے وہ اردو میں ہے بیان کے انداز وغیرہ اردو میں زیادہ لطف ملتا ہے انگریزی کے بجائے تو اور حال اشار یہ تھا کہ یہی نفس امارہ اس پر آرمی محنت کرتا ہے تو محنت کرتے کرتے یہ نفس امارہ نفس لوامہ بن جاتا ہے نفس لوامہ اور یہ نفس لوامہ وہ ہے جو اب اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی کی یاد کی طرف مائل ہونے لگتا ہے اللہ تعالی کی یاد کی طرف مائل ہونے لگتا ہے اور اب جو ہے اس کے اندر ایک دلچسپی ہو اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی کی طرف رجوع کرنے کا تو اس کا پہلا قدم یہ ہے کہ اس آدمی پھر توبہ اور استغفار کرنے لگتا ہے اور جو پشری زندگی ہے اس پر وہ اب نادم ہوتا ہے تو توبہ اور استغفار کے عنوان پر کچھ بات چیز ہو رہی تھی گزشتہ مجلسوں میں تو آج جو بیان کرنا ہے وہ توبہ اور استغفار کے سلسلے میں 
کہ جب آدمی اب توبہ اور استغفار کرتا ہے تو توبہ اور استغفار کے شرائط ہے یعنی اس کے توبہ کے قبول ہونے کے لیے کچھ شرائط ہے یہ شرائط اس کی اپنی جگہ پر ہوگی تب ہی جو ہے اس کی توبہ قبول ہوگی ورنہ جو ہے توبہ قبول نہیں ہوگی تو ان شرائط کا لحاظ رکھنا جو ہے یہ بہت ضروری ہے It is important that a person adheres to certain conditions and under these conditions only will a person's tawbah be accepted. Otherwise, without these conditions, a person's tawbah won't be accepted. It is for this reason that we find that we make tawbah and istighfar many times in our lives, but then too, we are still persistent upon the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the prime reasons for this is because we do not adhere to the conditions of making tawbah and istighfar. <coughs> So these conditions are very very important. If you want our Tawbah to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first condition is that أَنْ يَقْلَ عَنِ الْمَعْصِيَةِ That when a person makes Tawbah and istighfar for the wrong that he has done or the wrong that he is doing, the first condition is that أَنْ يَقْلَ عَنِ الْمَعْصِيَةِ That he abstains, he stays away and he moves away from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can't be disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time be making Tawbah. First of all, the first thing is that the person is different from the person. The person's sin and the person's sin are not different from the person. You can't have the continuity of disobeying Allah and the continuity of making Tawbah. Which means the first condition is that whatever disobedience a person is involved in, that they move away and abstain and leave the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are different types of sins. Some are those sins which a person commits for a short period of time and then a person stops. And now when they have stopped from it, they are out of the sin. And there are other sins which a person remains persistent upon throughout his time. For example, a person steals. So now when a person steals from somebody, it is during that period of time that they are stealing, that they are disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once they have stopped, they have stopped. And another is where a person may be dealing in haram. Because they're dealing in haram all the time, as long as they're in that business venture, all that period of time they're living in haram. <coughs> that the whole period of time is spent in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> so this way there are two types of sins. With regards to period and time. <coughs> so the first condition is, that a person stays away. When he makes Tawbah, he stays away from that disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he leaves them. So you can't be that person is in the amusement park, he's in the amusement center, and he's putting the coins in the jackpot machine, the machines that are there, in the arcades and that. So he's putting the coins in and he's, he's gambling away. So whilst he's putting the coins in, he's saying, Allah forgive me. And he's putting the coins in and he's saying, Allah forgive me. So he's gambling away there. He's doing the master of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time he's saying, Allah forgive me. Let's put another coin in, Allah forgive me. He's stealing. And while he's stealing, he's saying, Allah forgive me. So such type of tawbah will never be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first condition is that whatever disobedience we are involved in, that we stop the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You move away from that, you leave that sin, and then you make tawbah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept the tawbah. Whereas if a person is still doing haram and at the same time he's saying Allah Tawbah, Allah Tawbah, then you'll find that <coughs> there'll be Tawbah on his Tawbah instead. That the such type of Tawbah won't be accepted. That he's disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time he's making Tawbah, which means that he, he doesn't really uh, regret that which he's doing. <coughs> he still takes lightly what he's doing. Otherwise he wouldn't be, in other words, this is actually a mockery with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he has continued to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and on top of it he is saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah forgive me. The first condition is an yaqla al maasiyah That a person stays away from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, move away from it and by moving away from it then you make tawbah and istighfar. And one of the most beneficial ways of staying away from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to move away from the sin or to move away from those things that will even lead us towards the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if a person still stays close to where the sin is taking place, means that a person now he makes toba, but then he still frequents and he still goes to arcade centers. 
say, no, I'm not going to gamble anymore. I'm not going to waste my time on these futile things, but he still goes there. Say, no, let me just take a walk around there. See what's happening, go meet somebody there. He's made some friends there, let me go and meet these friends there. So he still goes there. In the same way, a person may be in a wrong and incorrect company. In company of such people who are abusing drugs and that. So now he abstains from it, but he still goes and he meets with those friends that still are involved in such type of things. So the more he stay in that environment, that company, the more and more difficult it will become or impossible it will become for him to stay away from that sin. He might stay away from it for, for a moment or two, but then obviously the condition, the, the environment that he is in, the company that he is in is automatically going to draw him back into the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is imperative. So she also you'll find for those people who are involved in Ishqi Majazi, in illicit relationships as well. Many times you find that when people do contact me for these reasons, then there will be those who say, well, is it okay if we just remain as friends? There's no such thing as being able to, to remain as friends. Or is it okay if we just correspond with one another once in a while? Remember, as long as that connection still remains there, that flame will not be extinguished. The flame will remain there. It is the way you have a fire. The only way you can extinguish it is you pour sand over it. Or just leave it to die out. But you find that if you're going to put firewood close to that fire, or you're going to put firewood onto it or close to it, or even once in a while, you say, once in a while, let me just put a, a small twig on it, I put a bit of a log there, once in a while, what will happen is that fire will continue to burn. Even if that fire is now dwindling or, or, or dying out, the moment you put some firewood there, again it's going to be erupt again. And this is what will happen. That even with time, even if on the separation, the, the relationship or the, the, the love, the illicit love that occurred in the heart, even if that starts becoming lesser. But the moment there is that slight contact as well, the just free or, or the text message even if it is, or tweet whatever, you'll find it will rekindle the love that is there, the desire that is there. And in this way it will become impossible for a person to stay away from that individual. The only way is that an ma'asiya, that a total clean break. But now there is no relationship at all of any sort, any communication whatsoever of any sort. And if in future Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants that they will meet in a halal manner, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up the means for them. Until then, until that opportunity doesn't arise, then they should remain totally separated from one another. This other person thinks that never mind, we'll just speak with one another over the phone. Or just the odd email or the odd texting here and there. None of these things are permissible. And never mind, at least a relationship. These things are not even permissible between that boy and girl who are due to be to, due to marriage or those who are just even engaged or due to be engaged. Such type of communication is not permissible between them as well. Things that we take for granted and we take lightly that okay we are due to marry one another and today nowadays we find this the concept that we have that boy and girl need to know one another before they get married. Boy and girl need to fall in love before they get married and then we have the marriage after. And on this what happens is many times the parents even consent to this. The parents also consent on this. To that extent that you even have those parents who allow the boy and girl to meet with one another. Even if it means meeting in seclusion in the, in the house, in the room in the house. Or even if it means going out together so that they go out and they can get to know one another. They'll go out and start doing, preparing together, shopping together for the wedding. All these type of things are haram. Just because you've now given your word the, and uh, the engagement has taken place, that doesn't mean that they have now become husband and wife, that they become halal for one another. They're strangers. They're strangers as just any other boy and girl, the way they are strangers, these two are also strangers, until they do not come under the act of nikah, under the, uh, under nikah, under the oath of nikah, they're haram for one another. So any form of relationship of this manner, communication of this matter, or getting to know one another, all these things are not permissible and this is haram. And a person wants to know the likes and dislikes of the future spouse. So there is manners behind it, ways behind this, by means of finding out from those who are close to them. If it is a boy and he wants to know more about his his uh, his fiance, then he has the, the option of finding out through her brother or another male mahram. What are certain things that if he needs to know, if he wants to know. And in the same way, she can find out in these way, manners as well. And not where we consent to it in such a manner that the parents even allow them to talk with one another. And in this way, what happens is they think that they're building up a relationship. They're getting to know one another. But then there is 
they are now ruining the soul, the ruhanit of the nikah to come. Because by doing so, all the barakat of the nikah is being ruined. In doing such things which are contrary to the sharia, doing such things which are contrary to the, the sunnah and the correct way of things. It is just a case of boy and girl who will see one another once and they now like one another. And as soon as possible the nikah should take place. And that is why it's very very important as well, the nikah should take place as early as possible. Nowadays we have where the engagement takes place, the boy and girl or the families have agreed to the nikah. And now the nikah still takes place a year on. We've still got to earn. We've got this to do, we've got that to do, we've got this work to finish, we've got this studies to finish and that. And now what happens is the nikah is still going to take place a year on. You do it what happens, boy and girls still go to university and why is at university, they're meeting with one another. And now because they think they're engaged, so what happens every weekend they meet with one another, every fortnight they meet with one another. In this way, they, in other words, they're dating one another now. And they are the misconception, they think that this dating is fine for us because we've given our word that we're going to get married to one another. And many a times in that year that we have, in between, in that year, the marriage or this agreement or the engagement also is, comes to an end. This is a long period of time. And in this then what happens is, uh, and one of the things that does happen is now they start to get to know one another. And now they start to get to know one another. Now obviously boy and girl, not each and every one is going to be perfect. You're going to see certain things there. So certain things which under nikah would have been tolerated. Now because there isn't that oath of nikah, it's not going to be tolerated. So now the girl she's going to break up saying, look there's certain things in him that I do not like. So for that reason now everything is in turmoil and, and it comes to an end. Otherwise he sees something in her which he doesn't like but which it comes to an end. It breaks up. So many arrangements or engagements break up before the nikah, before the marriage just because of this long gap in between. And the sharia is without any first, the sooner the better. The boy and girl have agreed to get married to one another. Then whatever necessary arrangements need to be ta- need to, to be done, get those over with, and as soon as possible, the nikah should take place without such a long pause in between. This is mentioned to you. So where a person may be involved in such form of illicit relationship with somebody, the only way of staying away from it of Pure Toba and Istighfar is where a person totally severes any connection with that individual. By severing such connection with that individual, then only you'll find that there'll be bliss in the nikah. And nowadays we find that it's a case of, it's become a norm. This form of a relationship between male and female, or what we'll call boyfriend girlfriend relationship, this has now become a custom in, in the past. It may have been a custom amongst non, non-Muslims, non-believers, but now we find that even we as Muslims, this is the way society has become, that it has become a norm. A norm that at a certain age, or rather now from a very young age, it is just natural or normal, or rather it is demanded that a person, a boy should have a girl that he likes, he should have his girlfriend, and the girlfriend, he, girl, she should have a boy who she likes. So it has become something that is accepted in people, that all... And if somebody doesn't, then they are thrown under. How can it be that you do not have somebody? How come it is that you do not have a boyfriend or girlfriend? This is the pressure that is placed on a youngster today. And this is unfortunately the environment that we have. And one of the, the reasons for this is, which is neglect from with regards to the parents. The parents who even allow such form of relationship as well. That when the children now become of age, that already they should be separated. Boys will play with only boys and girls with only girls. If you're going to continue with them intermingling and mixing, when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa himself has mentioned with regards to siblings, that boy and girl when they reach the age of 10, then their sleeping accommodation should be separated as well. So this is with regards to brother and sister. That those who are not related, then all the more they should be separated in this way. So a boy already knows from a young age that his company is boys. And the girl knows as well that her company is, is girls alone and not with, with one another. So in this way we find the environment that we are living in, it has become something that is acceptable. But our society is such that rather people have a partner or somebody that they, they are living with but they are not married with. And unfortunately because of this our Muslims are also following suit and this is what happens Muslims see non-Muslims do things. And Muslims want to also jump onto the bandwagon and Muslims want to become the same as non-Muslims. 
in this way many of our Muslims have relationship and you see so many people in, even in the open going out with one another in such a manner and nobody even frowns at it and the reason being is because it's accepted within the home the parents are allowing when the parents are allowing such form of relationship then obviously the youngsters will also regard it to be something that is acceptable if, the, if they've got this permission from the parents and it is because of this freedom that we have given the children we find the amount of chaos and havoc that we have nowadays we find parents who are always complaining that the children are getting married to their choice of boy or girl and obviously they are going to do that when you have given them permission when you have given them that freedom to choose their company to choose uh, their friendship when you have allowed and you have set such an environment then what do you expect? you have let them lose you have given them all the freedom that they want you have given them all the means of freedom as well you have given them freedom of a mobile phone you have given them the freedom of surfing the net as much as they want they've got their own internet access they've got their own laptops and own computers and that then what do you expect? you've given them all these things and then you complain that they've gone and fallen in love with somebody now you complain that they've chosen somebody and they want to marry with somebody who isn't of your choice now you're complaining with who they are dating who they're going out with and who they want to marry and that so now what happens is now they come to the ulama asking for some taweez or some dua some wazifa or something like that to break the relationship or to explain to the children and that is the problem they've allowed them they've given them the permission and now everything goes wrong now they expect the, them to come to the ulama now the ulama has to set it right and the alim now has to advise the child if I now move away from these, these things are wrong at this time and to be quite honest it is beating your head on a wall because now love hubu kushay yu me wa yusam Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi mentions love for something makes a person dumb and it makes a person it makes a person blind and it makes him deaf. This we find in English we say love is blind. In English the saying is that love is blind. And Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi himself has said that the love for something it makes a person blind. That the person cannot not now not see the reality. And people are just, when they're told and this is what happens where our youngsters fall in love with a non-Muslim. Fall in love with a non-Muslim. And now they are adamant that they want to marry that non-Muslim. And when you told, tell them and mention to them the ills of that. Then okay, fair enough, just for the sake of nikah, even if that person becomes a Muslim. But then too, there are a lot of differences that are there. But hubu kushay yu'mi wa yusam. Love for that individual makes them blind. They can't see other incidents where things haven't worked out because they are blind to them. Explain to them, give them examples, they can't see these things. Advise them, give them advice, they, your talk, your speech, your words falls on, de de on deaf ears. Why? Because it makes them deaf as well. They don't want to understand and realize. And this is what happens. Unfortunately, this is also something that is so common. And the reason for this is because our youngsters' minds have become so corrupt. And because their minds are so corrupt, their hearts are so corrupt, their gazes are so corrupt, that all they like is corrupt people that they see. And because of that, Instead of, for, instead of getting married to Muslim women, those who are chaste and pure, their like is no longer towards them, but rather they might find them backwards or old fashioned or so, but they are more inclined towards those who are azad, who, are, who, are freed, who have freedom, those who are just so impure, and those that they see in various forms of nudity, because their minds and their hearts and their gazes have become so impure, their hearts also fall, fall for impure ones. They don't realize that they are now falling for somebody who has no iman, who is so impure. How can you trust such an individual as well? How can you even trust such an individual? But they're just seeing that apparent, whatever they see, likeness that they see in an individual. And because due to that now, they want to live the life of that individual. And for the sake of just the, the customary nikah, they just um, make them read the shahada, they come into the fold of Islam just for the sake of become, for, for nikah. Or there are many those who do not even bother about the nikah, especially if the other one doesn't want to become a Muslim, if the girl doesn't want to become a Muslim. And in this way they have this relationship the whole time. What they don't realize is that they are choosing that which is impure for them, that which is haram for them, instead of that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given for the Muslims. And even though there is the masjid with regards to nikah with the, the Ahl Kitab, but remember even upon that, that is something that hasn't been desired because of the great differences and also the difficulties that a person faces later on. But once a person is bitten with this the serpent of illicit love, then a person becomes totally deaf and a person becomes blind to what the reality is. It doesn't make sense.
But then later on it makes sense. When does it make sense? When now, when things, the reality comes to face. And now when it is already too late, that's when a person, it makes sense to the individual. And then it's too late for a person to now change things. And that's when they regret and, and they wish that if only we hadn't done what we had done. And this is the reality. That whoever a person has fallen in love with this way, the moment the beauty changes, or the character of that person changes, some differences come about, then you find that that, that balloon of, of desire and fantasy, was that is popped and the reality comes in, in front, and all the dreams and everything, fantasy disappears, when reality hits home, then that, that is when a person understands. But prior to that is the case of a person totally deaf and blind to these things. They don't not want to heed to any advice given to them. As I mentioned to you, one of the root problems is the parents who have given the children such form of freedom. Where now small, small children, small, small children kids have their own mobile phones. And what they do on the mobile phones, the parents are unaware of what they're doing on the mobile phones. There's a time wherein even adults didn't have mobile phones. Adults were not even so reliant upon mobile phones. And now we have become so reliant and so addicted to the mobile phone that we can't live, we can't do anything. person just leaves the house and is forgetting his mobile phone, that is, that is. And if it's a case of he can't return, until he can't return, he is, he is at an I mean, who's, Who must have phone, this missed call, that missed call, or missed this text, or missed that email and that. Now we say a person doesn't need his, his computer and that because now he's got everything. They are on, 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 on the mobile phone. And this is how things have become, where everything is just there on the mobile phone, wherein you can just keep up to date with all your friends at all, 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 at all occasions. The person becomes so dependent upon it that the person can't do without. So the same fit time field, which was separated, now you find that is with a person all the time. It's in the pocket all the time. So the children have been given this freedom. So now what happens in the possible case of even if a boy liked the girl, he knew that the chances of communication with her are going to be remote. Either there be those who in, in, in school or university, never mind it's university, now we're talking about school. There will be those in school who will definitely, everybody knows one another, they'll go and mention it to the parents. Somehow or another, people will know about it, basically, okay. will become ridiculed, so they'll stay away from that. Also, it was a case of... There is no way we can meet with one another because after school we are going to madrasa, we in our environment, there is no way of communication. There is no, we can't even contemplate phoning or speaking in this way. So in this way, even if they wanted to, they couldn't meet with one another because the avenues were not, not open. But now what has happened is that we ourselves have opened up the avenues there. That now the small child has a mobile phone, the boy has a mobile phone, the girl has a mobile phone. So now it's a case of 24-7, whenever they desire, whenever they want, they can chat with one another. They can communicate with one another. To that extent that even if they're sitting in one classroom, one's in front, one is, one is at the back. Even then in that way, with their backs to one another, they can be communicating with one another. So this is how it has become. And it is parents who blame who have given them access and have given them such freedom. They are given the laptops, they are given the computers and that. They have internet access on their own. They are in their bedrooms doing, saying that they are doing their essays and they are doing their school work. Without, without any parental... Uh, without any uh, uh, parents being there, keeping an eye on them. And then what happens is, uh, is that they are saying that they are doing their homework, they are doing various work studies that are there, but they are free there and Allah knows us what things are going on and who they are chatting with. They have given freedom. And parents have allowed them to open up the, or have their own email account. And they are talking about small children. Small, small children who have their own email account. Now, what is so important, who is so important for them to have to email? So they have their own email account. And worse than that is they have their own Facebook profile, which is even worse. Small, small children. And they have all those things which adults shouldn't have. Which even if adults shouldn't have, you find that children have these type of things. And their mobile phones are not just old, okay, mobile, limited mobile phones. Because the children know more about the mobile phones than the parents, so they want those mobile phones with capabilities. With all the things, with, up to, all, with all the various social network working uh, 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 things on it. This is the type of mobile phone that they are demanding and they want as well. And with, with the, the, the same friend that they spend the whole day with, they want to communicate with them as well later on. But in that what happens is, <coughs> that the phone number, the Facebook profile or 
or the, the tweet address or in the same way the email address it gets spread out and this way what happens is they, they start having communication with friends the time we're in boys did not have girlfriends they didn't have female friends female friends okay never mind in the, in the context of what we say boyfriend girlfriend a, a boy did not a male did not have female friends they will take friends and a girl did not have male friends at all it was regarded to be a flaw something unacceptable for you to just have mates or friendship with somebody of the opposite side but now even if it's not a, a intimate relationship now it's become common that a female she'll have so a girl will have so many of her girl friends who are females and so many friends who are males as well and if just be normal chatting that they'll say and in this way you'll find that on their Facebook they'll have their Facebook account and on there they'll have all their likes and preferences and then all their friends are on there as well and they are joined so they'll in the own, on their own profile they'll have so many uh, uh, males and females and girls and boys on their profile and then somebody else joins they go there and they see pictures of other people they like those and then they'll ask them request them to become friends with them as well and it's from this that things go from where to where and you'll find that Facebook which I mentioned often it is a poison it is a poison and which is destroying the Iman, the life of many Muslims the Iman and the life of many Muslims so many Muslims have become non-Muslims due to Facebook and so many married people male and female have broken their marriages and destroyed their marriages as well due to Facebook where the elderly even even they feel they don't want to be left out as well we in the 21st century then why not we as well you have all old people who should rather be worrying about their, they should be worrying about their cover now worrying about their profile in the cover that when we go in the, in the cover of what their profile is so instead of worrying about their profile in, of the cover they now making their profile as well on Facebook they should be worried now of what's going to happen underneath of their, that who their friends are what their likes are there are, uh, what's going to happen with them in, in the grave but instead you'll find even all old, old people want to be on Facebook as well this is how it has become so that which was initially maybe even initiated as just a social network as you call it as a socializing and that now you'll find that this Facebook is actually is another name for a dating site it has now become a you, you can say legitimate or a halal, a halal form of a dating site that instead of making this way, you know, it's only a Facebook profile but everybody knows what goes on on there how easy it is and unfortunately, unfortunately you'll find many of our Dini institutes and them they've also gone on to why should they be left out either so they've also jumped onto the bandwagon of Facebook where you'll find there they're talking about Dean and that but at the bottom you find it's all male and female pictures there and who, are, who, who like who like whatever's there on the profile and they give their there or their, their opinions and that and then somebody here with the intention of wanting to learn Dean goes on there and he likes somebody there as well so there's those putting their likes and they'll have those who like those who are putting their likes there and in this way then they'll be wanting to become join their group or their friends and this and that and from where do where things go on? where do where things go on? and remember dear friends just the fact that people are using Facebook does not mean that because they're using Facebook we need to go on Facebook and give dawah to them People are frequent in the nightclubs, that doesn't mean that we go there in the nightclubs and start giving them dawah. So if that is wrong, it doesn't mean that we need to go we use that method as well to give dawah to them. Those who can log on to the internet to go on to Facebook, they can log on to Islamic sites as well if they want to learn what deen is. It's not necessary when we know that this is something that is so corrupt and so poisonous. That never mind us as Muslims saying that it is wrong, you'll find that even so many non-Muslims are also admitting to the fact or acknowledging how dangerous this is. Just recently there was a headmistress of a school who herself was mentioning the, the, the evil of Facebook and the effect she has seen on her school children of the manner in which you know the, the students or the female students are showing themselves or the way they are have their galleries in that in the manner in which you know they are showing themselves on, on it or the pressure that is on them to be put on there and they'll find so much bullying bullying also takes place on Facebook these type of things and obviously the most important thing is and this is the bayan of mine is on the, all over the internet as well on the matter of boycotting Facebook this was with regards to the issue we had a few years ago 
when they had the page on with regards to the, the Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ridiculing Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So such an organization which has allowed the, the ridiculing of Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who have promoted the ridiculing of Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, such a site should definitely be boycotted by Muslims. We find unfortunately, we allow these things and we will support such, such companies. If all the Muslims stop and boycott it, there will be a big effect on it. But he said, we find that no. Instead of loving Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we are more worried about our profile on that, that we shouldn't be left out. Everybody's on Facebook, why I shouldn't be on Facebook? But one thing is for sure, you won't be left out. Nothing, no wrong will come to you if you are not on Facebook. No wrong will come to you if you are not on Facebook. And the reality is, dear friends, if somebody wants to communicate with you, want to contact you, whether you've left your phone at home or you have your email or not, whoever wants to sincerely contact you will contact you with some means or the other. The world moved, the, the world existed even before Facebook and before internet. And the world will continue to live. People communicated before as well. In the same way they'll continue to communicate without these things as well. So dear friends, whoever, and this is a request to you all, that whoever does have a Facebook account, but the moment you log on to your next, you log on to your Facebook, log out of it or delete it or whatever you do to remove your profile from it. You won't be left out in any sort of ever, but rather you will find that you will be safeguarded and you will be saved from many fitna and many, many wrongs. Instead of worrying about joining groups there, having likes there, having part of other people's community or friendship or whatever they have there, rather instead of that save that Forgo these things and rather let me join the group of the pious people. Let me join the group of the pious people. Let me join up with them. Let me have like for them as well. Instead, let me have like for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me live a life like Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like the pious. Let me join the group of the pious individuals. Then you'll find that on the day of Qiyamah, Whoever al maru ma man habba, whoever person has love for in this world, on the day of resurrection, we will be resurrected with them. If we had love for the kuffar, if we had love for various football or sports individuals, if we had love for various actors and actresses, on the day of qiyamah, on the day of resurrection, our hashad, our resurrection will be with them. We will be raised with them. We will be raised with them. And tell me dear friends, on the day of qiyamah, when each and every single person will be worried about what's going to happen with him, and how important it is that we are amongst the righteous ones. Now imagine on that day, when we are resurrected, when we are resurrected, who are we resurrected with? We find that we are resurrected with Rooney. We are resurrected with some other f- football star. We are resurrected with some other person. We are resurrected with these type of people, some uh, actors and actresses uh, or other forms of celebrities. If we are resurrected with these, these type of people, whereas on the day of Qiyamah, then what's going to happen with us? However, they are dealt with, we will be dealt with with them because we are raised and resurrected with them. But if it's being with them, we'll become of them. Whereas if in this world we had love for the Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we had love for the Sahaba, we had love for the pious individuals, then on the day of Qiyamah, even if we could not become like them, at least even if we are resurrected with them, we might be treated like them as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show His mercy upon us just because of those people who we were resurrected with. al maru ma wa This is what Nabi Karim has mentioned. And this he mentioned when the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and when they were aware that in Jannah there's going to be various different stages, people will have their different, different, different abodes in Jannah, level in Jannah, according to how they live their life, knowing that Nabi Karim will be granted the highest abode in Jannah. So those Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and who could not live without not seeing Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They couldn't live without not seeing Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just the moments of separation with Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, couldn't, they couldn't bear. So they were now concerned that when this is the case, that in this world, when we are separated with Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find it so difficult. Now when we go into Jannah, there Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be in his Jannah, we will be in our Jannah. Here we desire to see Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We just come to Masjid Nabi, we can see him any time. Then where will we see Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So for them, Jannah is not Jannah without the believer. In Jannah. They are in Jannah as well. But even then for them, Jannah does not become Jannah. Why? Because the beloved is not there. It is for that reason that you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya ayyuhatuha nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan maradiyya farkhuri fi ibari wadkhuri jannati 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions which we shall do with regards to nafs al which is one of the stages of, of the nafs. Allah Ta'ala mentions that this nafs al-mutma'inna will be told that udkhuli that nafs al-mutma'inna irji ila rabbi ki radhi mardiya fudkhuli fi ibadi wa udkhuli jannati when this nafs will be told to enter the jannat what does Allah Ta'ala say? Allah Ta'ala says enter in where my servants are and then he says enter in the jannat fudkhuli fi ibadi wa udkhuli jannati Allah Ta'ala mentions his ibad, his servants before he mentions jannat why? because a building, a place or a home it becomes a home with those who live there. If there is a house, but in that house there is no family, it isn't a home. But the house will become a home if there is a family within it. Depending who, who the inhabitants are, the value of that place increases as well. Allah Ta'ala has increased the value of Jannat because of those who will, who will inhabit Jannat. And that is what he says, Fi ibadi, my servants. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has placed the value of his servants over that of Jannat. And it is because my servants will be there that Jannat will be such a beautiful place. Jannat will be Jannat. But the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, this is their love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa dear friend, that they felt that what is Jannat? What is Jannat? What is the enjoyment of Jannat? If we're not going to be able to see Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another occasion Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa said to them, Al-Maru ma'ma nahabba that a person is with he who he loves the most. A Sahabi, or rather you find a villager came to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when was with regards to Madasta, when is the, the day of Qiyamah and Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied to him by saying that look what have you prepared for the hereafter in fact this is another fascination that we have nowadays of wanting to know not Qiyam, when, when Imam Mahdi is going to come when Sayyidina Isa is going to come when the Dajjal is going to come when this is going to happen when that is going to happen and in this what happens is, what happens is we've spent futile time and waste our time on various YouTube, various uh, this, whatever, fantasy and all makeup stuff with regards to these type of, of issues and that. The reality is, when Nabi Karim وسلم, himself didn't know when, the, when Qiyamah is, then who are we and you and I to tell people when Qiyamah is going to come? Nabi Karim وسلم, if he knew, he would have told the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, if you knew it, if it was something for us to know, it will be mentioned to us in the Quran. But Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa says to him, Bhai, what's the point asking you when Qiyamah is? The most important thing is that have you prepared for Qiyamah or not? Today, even if you were told exactly what date Qiyamah is going to come, we won't even prepare for it. So what does it matter? The reality is, that never mind asking when Imam Mahdi will come, we need to ask ourselves, Bhai, if Imam Mahdi does come, then what are we going to do? Are we ready for Imam Mahdi? Are we ready for Sayyidina Isa? Then you have the other group of people who just can't wait for Imam Mahdi to come. Who just can't wait for Imam Mahdi to come. Mata Nasrullah, Mata Nasrullah. Asking when the help of Allah will come, when Imam Mahdi will come, and then we can wage war and have this and have that, all the prophecies that we can come to. The reality is, dear friends, Imam Mahdi comes, the Jal is going to come. And the Jal is coming is something which Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself had seek, seek protection from. And in the coming of Dajjal is something that Nabi Karim Wasallam even taught us that we need to seek protection in fit that he must see Dajjal from the mischief of Dajjal. So something that Nabi Karim Wasallam himself was worried and concerned of, we are hastening and we want that to come soon. We want that to come soon. And the reality is if Imam Mahdi comes at that time, the testing times are going to be such, are we going to be, are we going to be bear that test? Are we going to be able to leave the comforts that we are in? Are we going to leave everything that we have in order to join the army of Imam Mahdi? Are we, Imam Mahdi? Do we have that ability or not? But we wishing and wanting Imam Mahdi to come. So that Isa will come, the Jal is going to come. These are going to be very testing times and not easy times. So the reality is, if these come in our lives, it's going to come. If it isn't, it isn't going to come. Whether we know of it or not. The reality is that each and every single person's Qiyamah is going to come. If we do not live to the major Qiyamah, each and every single one is going to live for the minor Qiyamah. And what is minor Qiyamah? Death. Mort. Death of another person. Death is a minor Qiyamah. And the actual end of the day, end of the world, Qiyamah is a major Qiyamah. 
Because at that time, when that Qiyamah comes, it is when everything will come to an end. In this way, each and every single person is going to come to that. The end of our life is our mind of Qiyamah. That is Qiyamah. We need to ask ourselves in this way, we do not know when the major Qiyamah comes, will come, we do not know when the minor Qiyamah will come. We need to be preparing ourselves for when that minor Qiyamah comes. Are we prepared for that minor Qiyamah to come? And that minor Qiyamah is definite. Whether we live for the actual Qiyamah or not, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Only Allah ta'ala knows best. But are we prepared for the minor Qiyamah which each and every single one is going to face? And the reality is, dear friends, the Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has just mentioned to us various signs, minor and major signs that indicate towards the coming of Qiyamah. Nothing has been specified as to when Qiyamah will come. And when nothing has been specified of such, then for a person to waste his or her time in proving these, these occurrences, or in order to try and establish when these occurrences will come, this is just wasting a, a person's time. And you'll find people are fascinated with these things. They are addicted to these things. Or wanting to know when Imam Mahdi will come, where he'll come. Or, well, obviously there's few hadiths with regards to certain occurrences of Sayyidina Isa and when that. But who is the Jal? When will the Jal come? When will this happen? When will that happen? And these type of things. And in doing so, they defeat the actual purpose of preparing for these occurrences. They're not worried about when the time for Salah will come. Salah time is going and, com- going and coming. But they still sat there watching various these documentaries and things of people and in that what has happened is and this is something I mentioned many times that look when something hasn't been mentioned to us or something is general in the Quran if we now want to try and make that specific to something now we're going to be holding on to straws and doing so then we'll make anything so now where there is mention of Dajjal now what happens today people have tried to in order to try and prove Dajjal they've made all sorts of, all sorts of things into Dajjal this is the Dajjal, that is the Dajjal, this is the Dajjal, and this certain Qawm or community, they are Yajuj and Majuj, and this is this, this is not, and these type of things, and those who said that the Dajjal is in Britain or something, and something like that. All sorts of Ajeeb, Ajeeb things, people now want to explain and say to people, which I mentioned, which is far from what Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa has mentioned. Whereas we should be worried about, never mind that Dajjal, what about that Dajjal sitting in our hearts? We worry about that Dajjal which is within us, Never mind about the Dajjal which is here and there wherever he is. So we worried whether Dajjal, by Dajjal wherever he is, worry about that Dajjal sitting in us. Sort that out and, and save that, save ourselves from that Dajjal first. And if we do that, then inshallah there is hope that we will be saved from the major Dajjal. But now instead we worry. So this uh, person asked the weak name Salaam with regards to when the uh, hereafter will, when the Qiyamah will be, the final hour will be in the weak name Salaam with Jawami ul Karim, Nabi Karim Sassam, so beautifully, a lesson for us all, replied to him by saying, that look, what have you prepared for it? He said, guys, what have you prepared for it? That is the most important thing that we need to ask ourselves, that what have we prepared for it? And then he, in that conversation, mentioned Nabi Karim Sassam, that, oh Nabi Allah, when it comes to deeds and amal, my amal are weak. But what I do have is that I have love for Allah and His Rasul. I have love for Allah and His Rasul. Now remember here when he said to Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Amal, I haven't, there's no Amal, I have no Amal that I have done, there isn't much that I do. This is with regards to Nawafil voluntary Ibadah. Because a Sahabi, a, the minimum for a Sahabi was that a Sahabi was punctual upon all the Farais. They were all even punctual upon the Hajjud Salah. So it wasn't a case of that we didn't think, well, that is good for us, that gives us ammunition, you know, no Farais at all, no Salat, no Roza, nothing at all, but no, I love Allah and His I love Allah and His Rasul. At the end of the day, I've got love for Allah and His Rasul. That is enough for me. No. When the Sahabi said that with regards to Amal, I have no Amal. Referring to us, Nawafil, look, I haven't, when it comes to this extra Amal, no, I'm simple. I just do what is Farz on me, Farz Wajiba. These are things that I'm functional upon. Besides that, there's no other excessive Ibadah that I have done. Besides the fact that I love Allah and His Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, upon that, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that Al Maru Ma Aman Habba. That the love that you have for Allah and His Rasul, that will come in handy for you. That will come in handy for you. So that on the day of resurrection, you will be resurrected with Allah and His Rasul. You will be resurrected with Allah and His Rasul. 
So that is what I mentioned to you, that whoever person loves, if we have love for all these types of people, on the day of resurrection, we will be resurrected with them. And if we have love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have love for the righteous, the sahaba, the pious people, and even if we may not become like them, then there is at least hope that we will be resurrected with them. Once we are resurrected with them, then the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so their barak, so their blessings, and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gazes of mercy and compassion upon them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also deal compassionately with us as well. He will deal compassionately with us as well. And love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not frequenting, frequenting Facebook. That isn't love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is boycotting such signs. Boycotting such things. Who hosted the ridiculing of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those who ridicule, who hosted the ridiculing of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can we be favoring them? How can we be supporters of them? But rather in love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the minimum, this is the little that we can do. For the sake of Nabi Karim sallallahu for the love of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who any other person on his dying death is worried about himself. But Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even on his dying, on his deathbed, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is remembering who? Ummati, Ummati. Even then Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is worried about his ummah. It is the blessings of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we will enter into Jannah. Nabi Karim is concerned for this ummah, has granted us Iman. Whatever we feel proud of as being Muslims, whatever we feel of being favored by being Muslims of having Iman, is all due to the sadaqa, the blessings of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then finally if we enter into Jannah, it is all due to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in return for that, we have no love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That we favor and we support those who ridicule Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We love the, 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 the style, the fashion of others but Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the reality. Whoever you love, you, love, you like somebody, you love them, you'll, you'll, you'll have the, your hairstyle will be like them. You'll walk like them, you'll spa, speak like them, you'll emulate them, you follow them. Your dress code will become their dress, their dress code. So in this way you'll start following them. Why? Because you because you like that individual. You you'll follow them in every way, you'll you'll follow their fashion and that. And this is what has become to the fashion is what? What some celebrity or some person has now adopted that becomes fashion. And now you like that because you like that you start following that. That is a sign that you love that individual. The person who has love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's going to follow the life of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's going to follow the fashion of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He'll want his hair to look like Nabi Karim's hair. He'll want his face to look like his. He'll want his walking, his eating and everything. His appearances to look like Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He'll adopt the fashion of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of his love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is if he has love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he doesn't, and this is true. As believers we say, and yes, every single Muslim does love Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without any doubt. Every Muslim has love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But to what level do we have love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Do we have it at that level of which the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and had so much love for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Abu Dujana radiallahu ta'ala during the time of battle when it was the onslaught of the enemies were fighting arrows at Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so said Abu Dujana radiallahu ta'ala seeing that the arrows have been fighting towards Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he comes and he becomes a body shield to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam initially he thinks of coming in front and standing in front of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but even at that time, at a time of fear and war, immediately it tricks him that how can I stand in front of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with my back towards Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So instead he, he faces towards Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and 80, 80 arrows are placed on his body. That is in protecting Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning that he is willing to give his life for Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another woman, lady, in, in the battle her father goes, uh, her, her, her husband goes, her son goes, and they all become martyred in the, in, in, in the, in, in the battle. After the battle, she's walking towards the battlefield. Because that is why after the battle, they go to see who, who, who they find is living and not. She goes there. While she goes there, somebody consoles her and gives her the news that, look, you've lost your father. She hears that and she's asking, how is Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And again, somebody consoles her and says, you've lost your husband. She's asking, how is Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Somebody comes and meets and says, you've lost your, lost your son as well. He's asking, how is Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? In this way, she's not worried with regards to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
until she doesn't see Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam, she's not content. And when she sees Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam, she says, "Oh Nabi of Allah, no, no worry or concern is any concern compared to now that I've seen you. All my worries and griefs are, are free, are, are gone. That now I have seen you. And who is this? It is just one woman who loses her father he has lost so much. One woman who's lost just her husband has lost so much. That woman who's lost her son has lost so much." Here she loses her father, her husband and her son. All, all pillars of support she loses. But then too she's more concerned and worried of the plight of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when she sees Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is safe and well, all the grief is no grief for her. She's now consoled just by seeing Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what we say, this is what love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is dear friends. We do not have even a fraction of that love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the occasion where at the, at the spoils of war were given more towards the, those who newly came into Iman and shaitan then said misleading the Ansar that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is favoring the Meccans over them and that's when Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said one thing to them the O Ansar what is more beloved to you the spoils of war that there are those people who are now going to return with the spoils of war so what is more beloved to you going returning home with the spoils of war or as being ansar returning home with the prophet of allah what is more beloved to you immediately he hit home to them that the greed of the world had entered into their heart that they are so fortunate that they are those who are going to return home with the spoils of war and they mean the ansar are going to return to madinah al-munawwara with nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are fortunate that they are going to have the ma'ayyad closeness and they are going to have the company of nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is the love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we today, dear friend, we cannot even have, do just that much, that little, to boycott such sites who have hosted the ridiculing of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And even if we can't even do that much, that when we go, we delete our profile on that Facebook profile, even that much we can't do, we need to question our iman. We need to question our love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is a sahaba, they are willing to give their lives to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we can't even give up our own, our profile for the sake of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam our account on Facebook, we can't even make that one sacrifice for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and dear friends, who knows? we cannot give our lives to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but who knows, maybe even something like that it is difficult for us, but we've done that in the love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who knows, if maybe that might be enough for us to be resurrected with Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on a day of Qiyamah on a time where we will be wanting the, the intercession of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will want to go to the Hosea Kosar and be given by Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And who knows if we can't even do such. What if we then we are wanting the, the, the intercession of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam questions us and say, Why you now come to me? Could you not even make that one sacrifice of deleting your profile on Facebook for me? And Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns his face away from us, then where are we going to go? And this is the reality. This is the reality. On one occasion, two, two messengers, ambassadors of Iran or Persia came to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were sent by the Persian emperor. And when they came to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they came in such a way that they had no beards. And they had large, huge mustache. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seeing their face, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned his face away. He turned his face away. He disliked the way they looked. And even asked them that, whose appearance is this? So he said, this is the appearance of our face, of our emperor. So told him, remove, shave the beard and keep long moustache. And Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, خَالِفُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ أَوْفِرُ اللُّهَا وَحُ الشَّوَارِبِ That oppose the mushrikeen and do the opposite to them. That is, lengthen the beard and shave the moustache, remove and trim the moustache. They do the opposite. They remove the beard and, and they lengthen the moustache. The Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa mentions, do the opposite. Meaning that we should be opposing that. That our identity should be totally different to the identity of others. Why? Because we have our own identity. We have our own fashion. And our fashion is the fashion of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our identity and our way is that of the way of the sunnah of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That fashion and that sunnah which is the most simple to follow, which is the most easy to follow and economically as well it is the most easy to follow as well. Why? Because you'll find if a person wants to wear the jabba, 
and the jabba which is not identically, totally, 100% the clothing of Nabi Karim but it is that which is closer to the sunnah of Nabi Karim as there are hadiths mentioned when Nabi Karim wore a jabba and the jabba was similar to what we have today so in this way, a person who wears the jabba for example wears sunnah clothing or that's the clothing which is closer to the sunnah you will find that the jabbas are very cheap for a person to, to buy the sunnah is, is cheap but unfortunately now we find that that has also become commercialized now we have fancy designer jabbas Allah knows what's best we have designer naqabs as well we have designer naqabs as well and now we have designer jabbas and jilbabs and that as well so obviously you can go for those and the price is going to be quite high as well you can go for those things and this is unfortunate to be quite honest these are signs of how weak we are that we are like hope is best of both hope is best of both, best of both. we want both we want the sunnah and we want fashion as well so our jabba should be fashionable so the, like the trend this is how we are so the, 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 the jabba is we fashion, design aware as well the women they want to do naqab but they want to be fashionable as well so mix both together mix both together this is how we become best of both and the reality is that it doesn't work. Either brown he ho or white he ho. Isn't. So in this way, this is what happens. You say mix both, you have nothing there. You have a kachumar there. You have a mix it there and a mix it there is of no good. And this is what will happen. So the women, they want to do naqab as well, but they want to be in fashion as well. So now they wear fashionable naqabs and fashionable jabbas and fashionable whatever. So in the same way, the male, they want to wear a jabba and that as well, but now because of that, they want to wear fashionable ones. So they wear fashionable, stylish jabbas and, and topis and all these things unfortunately that's how we commercialize this way others have commercialized their religions we, we are now going into that route of commercializing our deen as well unfortunately so as I mentioned the sunnah of Nabi Karim Sazam is the cheapest easy to replace and the beautiful thing is that the sunnah of Nabi Karim Sazam remains the same other sunnahs or other ways other fashion are expensive it is expensive and fashion is always changing. Fashion is always changing. You'll have some style now, and then in a year's time, that is out of fashion, something else comes in. So a person every so often has to change their wardrobe. So just imagine how expensive it becomes. You have a new name, brand, trainers come out. You buy that for so much, and then what happens? Another brand come out. So now what happens is now you have to buy that. A new name comes out, new stylish tops come out. So now you that's the new fashion now. Now you want to buy that. And then that becomes, falls out of fashion. Now you have some other fashion. In fact, as time goes on, the fashion becomes weird and weird. And the way the fashion is today now, dear friends, that if you ask a person that look logically think that are these the type of clothing that you should be wearing, are they nice clothing? They'll say, no, look, it's not really nice. It doesn't look nice. But who cares about whether it looks nice or not? It's fashion. It's fashion. Wait, there's once a time we're in. A male would never even contemplate wearing neon colors or pink or purple. Would never think of these things. There was a time when, in, in, when we were young, a, a male, a boy would never even wear a woolly cap, never mind how, how cold it is. And now you see them, a boy wearing a pink woolly cap, you know, with the, those thing bubbles, whatever, you know, on the side. I don't know what they, are they, is a specific name for those? Wearing those things. Make it fashion. And if you look at them, even ask them themselves, well, do you look good in it or not? No, you don't. Okay, you look And you look at it, and it was a time wherein, you know, in our young age, you, you know, it's the only person would even wear these type of things. But now it's the case of, we have unisex clothing. The boy is wearing all flashy clothing. We have all the crystals on it. We have all diamonds on it. We have chains and necklaces and studs and all sorts of things with it, pink, green and purple colors. Do you? This is how it has become. This is how fashion has become. But the reality is, he doesn't mind doing that. Why? Because it's fashion. Because it's fashion, you like it. Even though it doesn't make sense, even though it doesn't look good, because it's fashion, it's fashion we adopt. And another example I give is so many uh, tops you find. That you look at it, you think that they're wearing it inside out. But the inside hem is in the outside. This has become fashion. Remember, we some years back when the mother said, Tell I looked at him and I said, You wear your top out in Zaydam. <laughs> and he insisted, No, he's got it right. And I'm insisting that he's wearing inside out. And then we found out by the zips, correct. So that means that. But then these are the tops where the, 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 the hem, whatever. 
the, the you find all that is on the outside. That which is supposed to be inside is on the outside. But in fashion, this is the fashion today. So you wear ulte kapre. Ulta ulta zamana hai. Kapre ulte pe na fashion hai. Be okufu ki koi kamini hai. Ajo hi na. If a person wants to do something, become famous to the most weirdest things that you'll get into Guinness Books of Record. You become famous to the most weird, weirdest thing, and you become famous. So this ulti zama, ulta dunya ulti. So you wear your clothing ulta as well, and on this whatever it's fashion. So because it's fashion, you don't mind. In a deep here, there's a zaman when when we hear and we heard that the Nabi Kareem the Sahaba of Allah Taala, they wore clothing with patches on it. So they they were so poor, they their the clothing had patches on it. Will frown at them. Who's going to wear such clothing? But then you'll find that when that became fashion, some years back we had these jeans, jeans with with with, with, with patches on them. Abhi shayad hoga with patches on it. When that became fashion, everybody wanted to wear it. Now nobody looks and says, "Okay, why you wear clothes with patches on?" We mentioned about the Sahaba wearing such things. We we ridiculed it, we laughed at it, and but when that became fashion, we started wearing that. And then those who had had complete trousers would actually tear the trousers to have you know te- to tear it deliberately. For it to to be fashionable, so when things become fashion, we want to follow it, and fashion keeps on changing. The fashion of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam, fourteen hundred years has passed. Over fourteen hundred years has passed, and the fashion of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam has remained the same. No matter which century we are in, the fashion of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam has remained the same. It has not changed. So for those following the fashion of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam, do not have to keep on worrying. Very soon you find, oh, this will be out fashion, and another thing will come in fashion. Now we need to have a new fashionable turbans, new fashionable uh, topis, new fashionable jabbas. They don't have to worry about these things because the fashion of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam remains all the time. And dear friends, one thing for sure is that if anything which is the sunnah of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if that becomes fashion, and if we follow it. Because if it is fashion, then is there we won't get the reward, but rather there it will be a case of a proof how much we dislike the sunnah of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That when we were told that keep the beard because it is sunnah of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we couldn't keep the beard. But then now, like now, the beard is becoming fashion. Now, when people will start keeping beards, we keep the beards. We will never get the reward of doing the sunnah. But rather, the case of that is proof. That there, when we were told to keep the beard, we disliked the beard because it was a sunnah of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But now, if some if some actor or some sports star keeps a beard, then we keep the beard. We're following that person. That shows that we love that person more than Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When we're told to keep the trousers above the ankles, if that becomes fashion again, because you find things which were fashion in the past are becoming fashion again. There was a the 60s, or we find the 70s, the Michael Jackson days, where everybody wore the trousers above the ankles. So they wore it above the ankles because it was fashion at that time. When these things come back again and become fashion, it will become easy for people to follow. That is proof that they loved the fashion and they did not have love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These things will become fashion again. People laugh. How can I wear my trousers above the ankles? But then when these things will become fashion, you find people will start following it. Our Muslim women as well. Even telling them, telling them, cover your hair, cover the, your hair, cover the, your hair. No tofik to cover the hair. Now, when covering the hair has become fashion, you find them all covering the hair. They're all covering the hair. But why are they covering the hair? Because it's fashion to cover the hair. Abdul Rikum, wherever you see, they're covering the hair, mashallah. But they're covering the hair not because it's the case of the hijab that they need to cover the hair, but they're covering the hair because it's become fashionable for Muslim women to wear the various headgear that they wear. And remember, whatever they put above the head, this is why there's punishment for that in Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam has predicted, when Nabi Kareem mentioned sinfani, let me know whom are that there are two groups of people. I have not seen them as yet. And these are who? The one is those who will whip and hit people with whips. And the other Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that the women kasiyadu na ariyatun that they will be clothed with as good as not wearing any clothes, and their hair will be, their hair and their heads will be like the hump of a camel. The hairs will be like the hump of a camel. The Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "I haven't seen them yet." But what will the punishment be? Is that they will be deprived of, never mind jannah, but they will be deprived of the fragrance of jannah. And the Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions that, and the fragrance of jannah, this is something that you can smell and perceive from such a great far distance. 
So never mind Jannah, if they deprive of the fragrance of Jannah, just imagine how far they away they'll be from Jannah. And remember, it's only Jannah or Jahannam. So you're not in Jannah, you'll be in Jahannam. This is the why, the punishment, the warning Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned with regards to this form of fashion. And you find majority of our women now are doing such where they're placing whatever they put on the, on the, on, on the top of their heads to, to raise their head so their heads now look like the hump of the camel. Ajit. The Sahaba, they couldn't contemplate these things because the Bikrims mentioned that these are two groups, I haven't seen them yet. Dear friends, we should be worried. We should be fearful that that admonishing or that wa'id warning that the Bikrims some gave of those the description that he said, I have not seen, we are daily seeing that. Or we may even be daily doing that in our own homes. Or our mothers and sisters may be doing that. Or we as or our females, we listeners, they themselves may be making their hair in such a way or putting such things on their head which is directly, they are directly 100% that which Nabi Kareem Sallallahu has warned. But in a case, on the name of fashion, they are willing to do this. Name of fashion, they are willing to do this. They should be warned. And they should leave this immediately because they are now the signs of Qiyamah. Because the signs of Qiyamah which we see around us, our duty is, these signs are going to be there. But we should make our attempt that we are not part of those signs. We are not part of those people which Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has warned regard. We shouldn't be those. So now it's fashion to cover the hair, women are covering their hair. The hair is now covered, the head is covered, but the arms are exposed, the chest is exposed. What form of hijab? That is the hijab. That is proof that the covering of the hair is just false. It isn't out of hijab, but it is there merely as fashion. That the hair is covered, but the rest of the body which is more important to be covered, or just as important to be covered, that is fully exposed, that is no hijab. But the reality is, dear friends, that that is a mockery of Sharia and Deen. And listen correctly, I am not giving any fatwa, but it is close that such mockery of Deen can lead towards Kufr as well. Istiza, mockery of Deen leads to Kufr. And if in this way we are making a mockery of Deen here, that we are adopting one part of hijab and not the other, this is a total mockery of Deen, that we are so conscious of covering the hair and that, but everything else is exposed. This is a total mockery of deen. Similarly, you'll find that those who do not keep the beard, but then they'll keep various different, different funny style beards. Again here, this is a mockery of the sunnah. You can't keep the beard, don't keep the beard, but do not make a mockery of the beard. <coughs> this is making a mockery of the beard. If we can't keep it, we can't do it, then don't do it. But do not make a mockery out of the sunnah of the Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We cannot make, make amal on the hijab. So dear friends, as I'm mentioning, if you cannot make amal upon the sunnat, don't make amal upon the sunnat, but do not make a mockery of the sunnat as well. And this is what happens, we, so many times we have, we have laughed at the sunnah of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ridicule people just because they have chosen to follow the sunnah of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we find that when these things have become fashion, then we want to adopt. These things, dear friends, are very detrimental to our Iman. I was mentioning to you, and I'll end on this, inshallah, that these two uh, messengers, when they came to Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, looking the way they were, seeing their faces, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned his face away, in dislike to how they, they had made the faces, how they had mutilated the faces by not having the beard and keeping the big moustache. So when this was the dislike of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this world, the Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, see them turn his face away. Imagine if we go to Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of Qiyamah, on the day of Hashr to the Rosy Khosar, in, in, in such a manner, what if then Nabi Kareem Sallallahu looks at us and he turns his face away, then dear friends, who are we going to go to? We will all be in need of the, the intercession, the farish of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If in this world Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed his dislike and turned his face away, Imagine there we go in such a way and if Nabi Kareem turns his face away, then dear friends, where are we going to go? So these things are very, very important that uh, still going back, initial talk was that of the importance of leaving the sin totally in the first condition of Tawbah, which was an yakla anil ma'asiyah, of totally leaving the sin. But whatever we've mentioned, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the tawfiq to make amal upon these things. 
It renders all ittiba of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam, love for Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam, love for each and every single sunnah of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiul alim wa tub alayna innaka antat tawwabur rahim. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun alal mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.